On this episode of This Week in Space, it's back to school, and we're rounding up what you need to know about the last six months in space flight, what's coming up over the next few months, and especially everything that's going on about right now. So it's been pretty busy up there. So stay with us while we take a look at it. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 78, recorded on September 8th, 2023. Back to space school. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Melissa. More than 10,000 clients worldwide rely on Melissa for full spectrum data quality and ID verification software. Make sure your customer contact data is up to date. You can get started today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. And by ACI Learning. IT skills are outdated in about 18 months. You can launch or advance your career today with quality, affordable, and entertaining training. Individuals can use TWIT30 for 30% off a standard or premium individual IT pro membership at go.acilearning.com slash TWIT. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Back to Space School edition. I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine. And I'm joined today with the interdisciplinary Tarek Malik, editor in chief of space.com. Hello. Hello, Tarek. Hello, Rod. How are you today? Good I'm good, prosper. but my life isn't as <laughs> exciting as yours because I don't have a gamer channel. <laughs> right? So, well, that's my that's my hobby, Rob. That's my hobby. <laughs> so. That's your hobby that's gonna make you millions. Tell me more. No, what well, we're starting with that? No, I said it at the like the end of last. I, th- I said that at the end of last week's episode that I have a I have a YouTube channel called Space Tron Plays where I play video games. That's about it. That's so Space Fortnite, Tron, Fortnite, and Star Trek, and Fallout. So soon I need, to be Starfield. Do I, I have, have to start to, calling you Space Tron now? No, no, you don't have to. Okay, but you know, if you feel the need, hey, more power to you, man. So <laughs> I feel many needs. That is not one of them. Well, <laughs> this week we have a special treat. Oh, there it is. Oh, that's me. So. Which is Tarek Malik, because we're going to do headlines. We're doing our back to school special. There's been a lot going on in the space racket, and we decided it was time to share that with you. But first, of course, we have a new space dad joke from my dear friend, devoted space dude, Martin Lawler. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Lay it on me, Martin. What did Werner von Braun say when asked how he wanted his funeral arrangement arrangements handled? <laughs> wow, wow, that's very specific for a for a, that, an opening joke. I don't know what did he what did he ask? I'd like a redstone for my tombstone. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> okay. Well, that that yeah, kind of sums it up. That that's a space nerd joke. You need to know like what the redstones were and all of that fun stuff. So yeah, my favorite <laughs> redstone illusion was when the Saturn. The Saturn one was getting ready for launch and somebody, because it was a cluster of eight, basically eight redstone tanks, right? For, mm-hmm. the, for the first stage, they called it clusters last stand. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> All right. As always, of course, we invite you to join Tarek's stream team and send us your best or worst space joke. Don't be shy. We don't get enough of them. And as always, don't forget to do us a solid. Make sure to like, subscribe, and do those other nice podcast things for us because you don't have to listen. Just like it. <laughs> that, that makes us look good. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, why are you laughing so hard at that? I don't know. You just get caught me off guard. As well. oh, okay. Well, the, uh, KFI is our big AM station here in the LA market, and there's a guy named Mark Thompson who comes on who's got a new YouTube channel. He says, you don't have to watch anything. Just like it so I can get some money. <laughs> so I thought, okay. All right, and now, drum roll. (laughs) We're going to all headlines. So we're going to skip our headline segment because this whole episode is headlines. It's like like back to school. (laughs) There you go. There it is. There's our headline stinger. And for those who may not remember, it's uh, Morse code going on in the background. We should should tell people why we're doing back to school because, you know, my, my daughter started high school this week, which is hard to believe uh, that it's been 15 years, but, yeah. but you know, it's a, it's a nice season to kind of get back to like the nuts and bolts of all the stuff that's happening in space as like a reset, because there's been a lot and you and I have been like running, you know, ragged, uh, all of these marathons. And we thought, you know, let's let people know what's coming up, not just this month, but some of the bigger things later on, 
uh, you know, the bigger issues that we're tackling, all, all right. that stuff. So that was like the origin, you know, story of our back to school special. Uh, yeah, and if today. anybody doesn't like what we do today, it was Tarek's idea. Ah, oh, that. no. So he, you know, you have to handle news minute by minute, hour by hour. Admittedly, you know, I wait until, you know, week three of the month and I, I look at some headlines. I think, okay, I need the top five for the five, four, three, two, one countdown section of the magazine. Oh, which one will I use? So it's a little more relaxed here. But, but <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. It's been a really busy couple of quarters. And, and it's going to be even more just from what we found to talk about, you know, today. Yeah. So starting with <laughs> it's Star Trek Day. Uh, I'm so excited. Uh, so, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> there oh, we go. Oh, I love it. I love it. We have to sing the song. Ba, 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 ba. Right? No, wait. Da, da, that's the Jerry Goldsmith one. Da, 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 da. Oh no, that's the, that's the cartoon one. Wow. Do you know that I, I the blanked on the original show, series? Okay, okay so I'm going to break in here. The the uh -oh. one and only the person here in. that you know clearly doesn't love space as much as y'all, but I'm learning to love it. But even I know the Star Trek theme <laughs> song, sir. So come on, Wait, get it together, going. Mr. Tartic. Keep going. You got to keep going. <laughs> So for those of you listening to audio only, Tark's playing with his uh, little Play-Doh Enterprise, which is it's, it's adding to the embarrassment. Can we move on to the story, please? <laughs> all right. All right. Wait. Wait. I didn't even show all three of my Star Trek ties, but it's okay. No. Um, oh, yes. Yes. Oh, do show us your Star Trek oh, tie. Oh, yeah. I've got my, people I've, to watch YouTube. Because I've got my yellow look command. At that. My command That's tie. That's your Jim that has, Kirk yellow tunic Star Trek tie with the with Enterprise the, logo the on it. On it. And the only problem is you haven't torn the the shoulder of your shirt yet to be a true Jim <laughs> Kirk. But that's okay. That's right. I've got my, I've got my uh, my nice pink and blue Star Trek Enterprise one. It's yeah. very very classy. That's got first, kind of a tie dye vibe to it. Yeah. It, it's the first uh, uh, non regular tie I ever bought. I bought that for myself, and I thought that, that fifteen dollars was a lot for a tie back then. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's not now. No. And then I've got my crew of like the whole original crew. From the original series on, on, on my tie, so I can keep them close to my heart whenever oh, I go sir. out. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, the sad part is that Pretty we good. all work from home these days, and so I don't have to wear pants, let alone put on a collar. Okay, shirt. okay. So <laughs> let's let's hear about this headline. It's Star uh, Trek Day. No, What's that it's Star mean? Trek Day, and and just you know, for 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 folks like Aunt uh, who. Uh, know the theme song, but maybe didn't watch the show too much. Uh, today is He's the day. He's never in, seen a single episode. <laughs> in sure 1966, uh, when Star Trek graced the airs for the first time. And in a fun twist, like a big double celebration, it's the 50th anniversary of the second Star Trek show, the animated series, uh, which oh, debuted uh, in... Yeah, right? So Paramount, who, who have le leaned into Star Trek every year, uh, they really are going, you know, they go big where they're, they're showing uh, episodes of the stuff that only appears on their streaming network uh, on CBS, like these broadcast network tonight. Uh, they've got uh, uh, specials on YouTube, on Twitch, on all sorts of different things uh, to celebrate it. There's um, uh, a new, um, I think, update for the Star Trek online game. Uh, all sorts of really fun stuff. There's a new uh, Star Trek animated series, like a short. They made like a, like a short uh, uh, animated uh, episode. Uh, just to kind of commemorate the 50th anniversary there. And they've got a bunch of sales. If you like uh, to shop online, like we were talking about offline earlier, uh, they have a lot of sales for Star Trek swag. But I think we're like in a new golden era for Star Trek because we've got like three or four different shows. The, there's a new animated show called Lower Decks that just premiered last night for its fourth season, which is amazing. The first episode is all about Voyager and it's hilarious. So everyone needs to watch it. I just... I just wanted to start off the, that it's Star Trek Day and we should all celebrate because when's the next time that we're going to have an episode recording on Star Trek Day? You know, it's a. Maybe probably, never. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so as as I bored people with before, I worked on D Space Nine for three seasons, which was great because it was the last three seasons they used physical models. And uh, here's my tragedy story. So at the end of the production, when we were wrapping things down and stuff was going out in storage, I was given a physical model of a D7 Klingon battle cruiser, which is about three feet long. <laughs> and this isn't, you know, this isn't an AMT model. This is a metal armature with putty and it's lit on the interior. And it was gorgeous. It was torn up because it had been modified for battle damage, but I was still just aghast. 
So I stored that in my attic for years. And after a uh, marital dissolution, which ended up with me leaving that house, I went back a few years later to get it. And the gooseneck and the forward crew, <sighs> yeah, compartment oh, no. had snapped off and was nowhere to be found. So I have the rest of it sitting around, but not that. And that's heartbreaking because besides the sentimental value, when you look at what those things go for in auctions, it's yeah. like, oh, I could have bought another in, boat with that. But in anyway. My, in my basement in a box is the 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 big three foot long mega blocks uh, Enterprise, the original uh, uh, NCC 1701. Um, and I had taken it apart carefully so that'd be easy to reassemble and uh, put it all in a box and put that box on top of another box. And as I'm walking up the stairs or down the stairs into the basement one night, <laughs> I hear like this weird rustling Ow. and I watch as the box that has the, the model on top of the other box just teeters and falls off and just smacks into the ground. And you know that there's like 5,000 pieces of Enterprise in that box all apart now. And I just have it as a heart. So, you know, we have like 40 headlines to get through, right? But yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Star Trek. And, okay, we're done. And, we're and done. you've now convinced <laughs> us all that you wear polka dotted underwear. So, there we go. So... All Moving right. on to Virgin Galactic, yeah, which is kind news. of the other extreme from Star Trek. Yeah, um, well, what's going on there? We keep hearing about flights, maybe sort of, kind of. Well, it's very interesting. You know, you know, as as this past summer has wound down, uh, Virgin Galactic did wind up. They're in a very tight financial situation because they need to make revenue, um, as they announced in their last shareholders call. And today, as you and I are speaking, they actually just completed their third commercial space flight. Mm. Uh, so that's the fourth space flight of the summer. They did a training one uh, earlier. And uh, and this one uh, was unique uh, in a couple of ways because it had, and this is this story uh, is from space.com. Uh, of course, Star Trek Day was from Paramount. Um, but... Uh, this one, you know, the uh, Virgin Galactic announced the date. So September 8th, Star Trek, they didn't say that's why they were launching uh, about a week or two ago. Uh, but then that was it. And normally, you know, these space tourist flights that we've seen, not just from uh, Virgin Galactic, but from Blue Origin, from SpaceX, they like kind of make it a bit of a show. They make it an experience. They herald uh, what's going on. Uh, because they want people to pay attention. And for this one, they had three passengers and and Virgin did not announce who they were until well after the flight today, which was very interesting. And I thought it was strange because I had reached out to them. You know, we want to celebrate the flight. We want to tell people who who's on it. And they're like, no, we're not going to, we're, we're not going to promo them uh, this one. And they didn't live cast it either, which is another departure from the past. Mm -hmm. And, and it would, what uh, I bring it up because it's, it's one of two things, Right or it's an example of two things. Number one, they're really getting serious into these flights where they're going to fly really regularly uh, time and time again. The people that flew on this flight were three of their earliest customers. The first one actually was Ken Baxter, an investor who was the first person ever to to buy a ticket for Virgin Galactic. For the then and bargain price of 200 grand, right? 200,000, that's right. And and then uh, 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 joining him on the flight uh, were uh, Timothy Nash, another investor from South Africa, and Adrian Renard, who is the founder of Renard Motorsports uh, in the United Kingdom. So, you know, uh, folks, these folks have had these tickets for quite some time. And uh, Virgin Galactic does have to fly these people out so that they can start selling more tickets at the current rate, which is now 500,000. Uh, I believe, you know, 450, 500,000. Um, so I think what we're seeing is a, a changing of pace for Virgin Galactic. They've, they've got this proven out. They're going to fly these people as often as they can, you know, make sure that they have the experience. They, they did tweet out several photos of the training where they do the G force training on, on airplanes and stuff uh, for these, uh, these three passengers. And, um, and so that, I, I thought that was, that was a very interesting thing. Now, the, the other thing that to, people should be thinking about is think about when you get on an airplane, right? And uh, when you're flying in economy to go home for the holidays, you know, is there a crowd of reporters at the gate uh, shoving microphones in your face, asking you, you know, who you are and, and what was it right. that brought you to this point to get on that airplane? No I one's going to ask about that. You know, it's like riding a bus these days. And I think what we're starting to see maybe a little faster than I expected is are the providers understanding that they're going to be flying these a lot? You know, um, they don't need to share, uh, you know, exactly who's flying or why. The people on these flights may not want to deal with interviews and, you know, going into it. They just want to go on the trip. 
So it'll be interesting to see how space tourism as an experience to be shared by space aficionados um, evolves over the next year or so as, as this, um, uh, this flight plan in particular heats up. They've got 700 people in line to fly yeah. and, and people waiting to buy tickets. Tapping uh, their feet. Exactly. It, it, it's also going to be interesting to see when Blue Origin starts flying New Shepard again, which we'll probably talk about a little later. Yeah, um, yeah, coming up on one year from their last failure. Yeah, you know, you know whether so. or not they, they follow suit with uh, promoting this or not. All right, let's talk about asteroid C9FMVU2. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you, Tell us the scary news. Did you did you did you hear about this? I heard about it yesterday, and um, uh, and and the minute I heard about it, it was over already. Yeah, there is a um, a small asteroid. It's only about seven feet wide, but as Bill and I told you and I on this very podcast, you know, there is no only about when it comes to asteroids themselves. Right. Um, and it was discovered yesterday, and it came five times closer to the Earth than GPS satellites about like two or three hours after it was discovered. So they found it like just before it flew by. And I'm not trying to do any fear mongering for anyone. I just want everyone to remember that we all live in space while we're stressing out about our bills or, or, you know, having fun at the water park to end summer. Uh, we're still on a chairs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that a chair joke? My Star Trek chair. Sorry. Cause sorry. it's Star Trek day. So <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, and this one was, uh, announced by the European space agency, which is the, the, the first that we had heard about it, but NASA does track them as well. And they said that it was, you know, too small to do really any, um, uh, a serious damage it most likely would have burned up or broke up unless it the, falls on you yeah. unless it falls on me yeah and <laughs> but it was too small to even be visible to amateur astronomers but they were they were tracking it and you know it was about a tenth the size of um the chalia binks asteroid you know for some perspective so mm -hmm. oh so um uh, but it's just you know a, a reminder that we all live in space you know and uh, I got a comet story that's a companion to this later on that we can talk about too. Because if you like asteroids, you're going to love these comets. This one, came, it flew within 12,000 to 550 miles of us. GPS satellites are about 36,000 miles. So. Yeah, so a little, little, little under halfway. All right. And uh, we're about to go to break. But before we do, I know you're burning to tell us about Starfield. <laughs> that's right. So Starfield, uh, the game, uh, is a a space kind of odyssey uh, experience. This, um, uh, our reviewers uh, at space.com uh, took a look at it, but the game itself is made by Bethesda uh, uh, Softworks. And it's been years in the making, you know, easily five, five to seven years that, that it's, that they've been, they've been developing it. And by all accounts, it's a phenomenal success. And the reason I bring this up is not so much because I love games, which I do, uh, do. or or I love space games or even Bethesda games because I do. do. I play Fallout 76 uh, and I've played the Fallout games forever. But uh, this game is described as NASA punk. And when they announced a lot of the details NASA earlier, what? NASA punk, right? Like, um, oh. you know, like cyberpunk yeah, is yeah, yeah. NASA all punk, Netrunners okay. and like techies and everything. And this mm -hmm. is NASA punk. It's like NASA, but... A twist and <laughs> when when they announced when they announced it uh they said that they spoke to people at nasa about a lot of the look and the feel of of this game so there's a lot of real world space history in it you can actually go to mars and find uh like the spirit or opportunity rover like in its you know death uh dune uh there you can uh, go to the the main planet, uh, to, which is called Jemison, named after May Jemison, right? Uh, and so I just find that really fascinating when real life, um, uh, real life um, uh, space kind of history melds with these kinds of things where people can go and find that stuff in the game. And I, I'm excited that I'm going to get to try it. I got to build a whole new PC because it's such a taxing and demanding game to uh, be able to play it. So wish me luck. I've never built one of those before. <laughs> but I, it's easy. <laughs> but well, uh, this is, you know, it, it's exciting to hear about this new career move for you. And uh, it's, <laughs> it's a hobby again. <laughs> so Ant has a question, a burning question about burning objects. Yes. Well, gentlemen, uh, you were talking about the asteroid story here a few minutes yes, ago and, and how it just, quote, missed us. Um, if it wasn't going to miss us, and again, this is someone that's totally ignorant to all of this, so I know nothing. Would it even make it 
through our atmosphere and, and, and be able to make contact uh, and, and actually cause a problem? Because it sound, the way you're describing it is it sounded like it was, wasn't a large asteroid. Um, yeah. But, but yeah. Would, it be a, would it have been a real problem making contact? Well, it's, it's a really good question. You know, seven feet across two meters uh, wide isn't very large, like, like um, you know, com- comparatively with other other asteroids. But well, like the, the, for perspective, Chelyabinsk was about sixty-three feet, I think. Yeah, sixty. Yeah, we were. Right. So it was. It was like a, a couple of minivans, you know. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that really that really depends on how much of it survives is what it's made out of and how it's assembled and put together. Cause some asteroids are like very loosely packed together like gravel. Uh, and when they hit, they just kind of flitter away when they hit the atmosphere. And some of them are just solid chunks of iron. And it's those ones that can have meteorites uh, that actually reach the earth. Uh, the, they're uh, an asteroid in space or a meteoroid and then a meteor in the atmosphere and then anything that hits the ground is a meteoroid. And if it explodes, meteorite. it's a bolide. Meteorite. meteorite. Yeah, that's right. Meteorite. And if it explodes, it's a bolide. So so this one, you know, I, I, I feel pretty comfortable saying that it most likely wouldn't have made it all the way down, that it would have burned up on the way in. Uh, the Earth gets hit and by like about 100 tons of material overall every single day from space. You know, most of that is like grains of, of sand or, or dust uh, that burn up, but some of them are larger, like, like this. And, uh, and we, don't see, we don't see them as, as, uh, as much as, as we saw this one. You know, sometimes they just happen uh, and no one sees it at all. So, but just you know, to put you, your mind at rest, Ant, if a medium-sized one does come in, given Tarek's luck with his chair and his coffee cup, <laughs> we know it's going to come down right in the center of his studio there. So I think there, there's a lot more people watching. <laughs> there's a lot and more his, people watching now, though. His I mean, polka the polka dot they, underwear will be singed. The, the, the fact Sorry. that they can see that they they can see this one this this quickly and then let people know about it. I think that if there's like a big Chelyabinsk type asteroid again, yeah. as long as it's not coming out of the the direction of the sun, which is one of the big blind spots that we have uh, as a as a. Uh, species and there are plans to launch spacecraft to uh, to put them at angles so that we could track that as well. Uh, I think that we would be able to at least get a heads up that this stuff is coming. So. so, so we have the tech to see the composition when it's that far away before it even gets to the atmosphere. No, no, they they, they would ha- it would have to be pretty large and pretty far out where they can study it with like a like a infrared or a, a uh, radio telescope to get that kind of stuff back from them. So gotcha. something this quick where they they find it and then it's in two hours. They found it optically by what was moving in the background. So uh, okay. well, and, and that's an interesting question though because you think you know in terms of composition. So when uh, Osiris Rex got to Bennu, as if I recall properly, we still didn't know whether it was a rubble pile or a rock, and it turned out to be a little bit of both, right? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, they 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 always they think that they know what 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 it's what it's going to look like, but then they have a that ground truth of you know actually being able to do it and actually um, getting the samples themselves uh, was good, was always like a an, an open question alone. You know, they were really worried about being able to, right. to capture it if it wasn't what they thought it was going to be. My about. point my, my point here is you'd think if the thing's rotating, if you were able to look at it in infrared and see how fast it absorbed to give off heat, that would tell you whether it was rubble or a solid mass, in theory. Yeah. And that's in how theory, they figure out. I am, you know, I am not a planetary of, scientist. So I mean, that's how they figure that. out, like, you know, ground composition on Mars when they fly over. It's like, okay, is this bedrock or is this sand or what? And largely it's just because of how it handles heat. We have to go to break. We really owe ourselves a break. The adult in the room says we have to have a break. So we'll be right back after this quick message. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Melissa, the contact data quality experts. The holiday season is more crucial for contact data quality than any other, especially with 74% of retail purchases being made through mobile platforms. This year, be prepared for any unforeseen changes with Melissa's five-step holiday preparedness plan. Step one, check your house lists twice. Up to 40% of all address changes are not reported to the U.S. Post Office. Meet USPS Move update standards and get postal discounts with Melissa's global address verification. And because Melissa is an NCOA Link full-service provider licensee of the USPS, you can rest assured your data will be automatically updated. Step 2. Enrich your marketing lists. Start with the address data you already have and let Melissa's premium data enrich your lists by adding addresses, phones, and emails. Step three, add address autocompletion at checkout. 
You can improve your customer's experience by expediting the checkout process with auto population and reduce address correction fees and overall card abandonment rates. Step four, distinguish between residential and business addresses. Watch out for residential surcharges. FedEx charges roughly 65% more for residential delivery and adjust shipping handling fees accordingly. With more people working from home, it's important to identify if a shipment is going to a residence or a business. And step five, digital identity verification. Make sure your customer is who they say they are. Melissa identity verification increases compliance, reduces fraud, and improves onboarding. And Melissa Enrich gives insight into who and where your customers are. Since 1985, Melissa has specialized in global intelligence solutions and contact data quality. Melissa continuously undergoes independent security audits and is SOC 2, HIPAA, and GDPR compliant. Make sure your customer contact data is up to date. Get started today with 1,000 records clean for free at melissa.com slash twit. That's melissa.com slash twit. All right. It's time to talk about India. What a yes. year for them. I tell you. I so, tell you. So Chandrayaan did three, did very well on the moon, landed successfully, rover yes. deployed. Rover moved about, uh, what, 330 feet? Something like so that. far, yeah. And now it's parked for the lunar night, which is two weeks of cold down to, depending on where you source your information, between 250, minus 250, minus 300 Fahrenheit. Not really designed for that. So battery chemistry can go south. Um, circuit boards can crack. Trace Traces on circuits can separate. So not really expecting it to come back, but they're also not completely discounting that possibility, correct? Yeah, September 22nd, mark your calendars. That's going to be gonna near the end of the month. That's when um, India is hoping that they're going to hear back from uh, the Chandrayaan-3 uh, uh, rover and lander, uh, hope, you know, if it survives the, the harsh lunar night. Now, it was never really supposed to to survive it. It was there for the lunar day, and that was the primary mission. And right. by all accounts, they've, they've accomplished everything. But uh, the reason that, that um, we had this on our discussion list is because not only did they succeed with this kind of, you know, shoestring comparatively budget uh, moon landing at the South Pole, uh, make a bunch of firsts, the first landing in the South Polar region. Near the South Pole. Yeah. Near the South Pole, like as we talked about with, with uh, Noah Pet Petro. Um, but they, did, they, they deployed a rover. They took some awesome pictures. They took pictures of the rover and the lander itself. Um, they've detected um, sulfur in the, the dirt uh, there. They've recorded moonquakes, which was really exciting uh, to, to see the, the early data from there. But I believe they were vibrations also from the lander, if memory serves. So something like that. Um, and, uh, and then they came off that success with two other big milestones. And one of them is the launch of a DTL-1, uh, which is India's first ever solar observatory. And that launched um, on, what was it, about uh, September 2nd. And it's in Earth orbit doing checkouts as it heads out to Lagrange Point 1, where it's going to just study the sun, uh, you know, watch it for um, uh, uh, for evolutions and changing over time to track space weather in, in real time. And, uh, and it's being back some spectacular images as well of the Earth and the moon together, of itself out there in deep space. And, uh, and then here on Earth, India actually tested uh, the parachute that they need for the Gangayan uh, crew capsule, you know, for landing back on Earth. And Space News has a, a really great, I think we're showing it now, a really great article about where Chandrayaan-3 fits in that structure, that it's, mm. it's this kind of tip of the iceberg where uh, it comes to India's uh, ambitions in space. So they're not just uh, landing on the moon uh, as, as like a one-off target. They've got this solar observatory campaign uh, that they're really looking into. Uh, they are making progress on human spaceflight. They've had a lot of discussions with their international partners. Um, they are working with NASA on, uh, and you mentioned this offline there, uh, their NISAR uh, instrument, which did launch uh, on another satellite uh, recently, if memory serves. And um, and they've got a lot of more things coming on in the, the pipeline. There's a new kind of small solid rocket, uh, a solid fuel rocket for smaller satellite launches uh, that they're, they're planning to, um, to fly. And of course, uh, they, they want to build this new crew capsule to launch their own astronauts eventually to the moon, too. And in the meantime, they, 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 they sent a, a, an orbiter around Mars. Uh, again, I think at about like a, a 
tenth of what NASA spent to get to Mars? Well, it was a tenth or was it was it twenty uh, like half? It was a lot. Third. Oh no, it was less. The advertised figure was like thirty three million, which I, I don't think. Most of the people I know don't really believe that as an all-in yeah. number, mm -hmm. but it was certainly some part of it. Um, but yeah, even, that's even that's, without the cost of the rocket, which yeah. it may not incorporate, right? Which is adds like another ten on top of it, or, or so. But that's still nothing. Um, yeah, I mean, the Mars NASA helicopter was about eighty million <laughs> by itself. That's right. And that's right. so, so the, you know, the interesting point this brings up brings to mind for me is you know when you look at these costs and the success, um, you'd think if NASA slash NASA JPL, but but NASA at large, there's got to be some leverage here, depending on the mission and depending on the goals, depending on the technology that's needed. If you can solve this technology sharing problem that the U.S. has with a number of countries, mm -hmm. not so much India, China, and others, but but really anybody. I mean, even Canada. You know, we have trouble. If you have a conversation with somebody on a technical or science issue in Canada, you can get into sticky wickets. But if that can be ironed out the economy here of being able to build and test a spacecraft at those costs and then fly it you know on the nasa side yeah you could really start doing some amazing stuff in planetary science and word word on the street well not on the street word at nasa sources is that that's you know being seriously considered but uh, i suspect it's a ways off we'll have to see what what the follow-ons are for these now, you mentioned the the uh, Genganyan uh, project that you know they're they're looking at, at testing that maybe in twenty twenty four, you know possibly with with, with a crew. That seems, yeah, that seems a little early, right? Yeah. Because they still have to finalize the spacesuits that they're going to need for a lot of that, which they have been building in the background, you know. Uh, and they did reveal their spacesuits, I want to say about a year or two ago, uh, as well. Um, but it's it's just a it's it's something to watch, not just for the rest of this year, but for the next couple of years uh, that. Uh, uh, our our listeners, uh, dear listeners, you know that you should be looking out because they are they are making steady progress, and uh, I don't think that they're going to be a competitor as much as a very valued partner in yeah. the future uh, going going forward. And um, and then we'll, we'll have to see what what the next step is, what the next big mission is going uh, going to be, and how that's going to to, to parse out. And we kind of have room for a partner. I mean, we partnered with Russia for a while. That's gone a little sour. And, you know, frankly, we have a story in here about that. But with the luck they've been having lately, that may not be the worst thing. Yeah. Um, you know, China's the next natural consideration, but that's unlikely to happen anytime in the near future. So, uh, yeah, India sounds like the way to go. But speaking of Asia... Japan right. has Slim Jims on the moon. That's right. This this is another space.com article, but uh, everyone uh, also covered it. I saw it in the Times, et cetera. But Japan's Slim uh, Moon, they call it a moon sniper, which I think is really interesting <laughs> for what you're going to call your mission. Yeah. Uh, but they, they call it that because it's a precision-based um, uh, mission. It's a, a small moon probe uh, that is designed to make very pinpoint landings on the surface of the moon and that they mention what the size of their landing zone their preferred landing zone was i couldn't find that it's fairly small it, it's a crater i believe it's it's a it's mm. not like a giant strip because they want to test the actual ability to pick a spot and land at that spot and then set down and it and like we were talking with noah petro earlier it, it's really strange this vehicle because it doesn't have like the landers the, the spindly legs that you would expect on these types of um, vehicles. It has these kind of crunch uh, tennis ball type feet that will land and then compress. Uh, right. And then it'll sit there for uh, a bit of time. So it lands kind of on its side, which I just think is really, really cool. And uh, and this this launched on a, a JAXA H2A rocket. And that's a departure because Japan is also trying to build a new uh, next generation rocket, the H3 mm -hmm. uh, rocket. And it did fail when they did a... Uh, a trial and uh and so they had to move over to this this version and they launched it with a another um, astrophysics laboratory called chrism that's an x-ray observatory that's going to appear into the um deep uh the deep cosmos in the x-ray light and look for uh uh, uh for for different types of, of objects in that spectrum so they were able to get like a twofer out of this launch and um and it'll take a while for for the slim uh, lander to get there uh, a few a few weeks uh but this the slim, slim by the way is short for smart lander 
for investigating the moon. Uh, and it, if they pull it off, it's going to be Japan's first soft landing on the moon. And, uh, and then they'll, they'll use that uh, to inform future plans because Japan wants to land uh, bigger, better probes on the moon. They are building a giant rover uh, for the, uh, the, the Artemis program, which is they partnered with Toyota on. So right. imagine an SUV. Uh, on the moon, that's what they're building. I guess they would need Starship to land it there, if not its own its own thing. Um, and so we'll have to see how it all goes. But you know, this right now it's on the way to the moon. Um, they've been doing they've been doing some 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 orbit raising maneuvers, and if all goes well, it will land at a target point within the Shioli crater in what is the most precise touchdown we've ever seen of a lunar lander that didn't have people on it. And I think it's a four month transit, right? It's a very low energy trajectory. It's, 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 yeah, it's a slow boat to the moon for sure. All right. We are going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by ACI Learning. Our listeners know the name IT Pro is one of our trusted sponsors for about the last decade. As part of ACI Learning, IT Pro has elevated their highly entertaining, bingeable, short format content with over 7,200 hours of content to choose from and adds new episodes daily. ACI Learning's personal account managers will be with you every step of the way. You can fortify your expertise with access to self-paced IT training videos, interactive practice labs, and certification practice tests. One user shares, excellent resource, not just for theory, but labs incorporated within the subscription. It's fantastic. I highly recommend the resource and the top class instructors. Don't miss ACI Learning's practice labs, where you can test and experiment before deploying new apps or updates without compromising your live system. MSPs love it. Retake practice IT certification tests so you're confident when you sit for the actual exam. ACI Learning brings you IT practice exam questions from Microsoft, CompTIA, EC Council, PMI, and many, many more. You can access every vendor and skill you need to advance your IT career in one place. ACI Learning is the only official video training for CompTIA. Or check out their Microsoft IT training, Cisco training, Linux training, Apple training, security cloud, and more. Join ACI Learning September 26th through 27th in London at the International Cybersecurity and Cloud Expo to experience the latest innovations in cutting-edge technologies. Learn IT, pass your certs, and get your dream job. Or if you're ready to bring your group along, head over to our special link and fill out the form for your team. Twit listeners receive at least 20% off an IT Pro Enterprise solution and can reach up to 65% for volume discounts depending on the number of seats you need. Learn more about ACI Learning's premium training options across audit, IT, and cybersecurity readiness at go.acilearning.com slash twit. For individuals, use code TWIT30 for 30% off a standard or premium individual IT Pro membership. For individuals, use code TWIT30 for 30% off a standard or premium individual IT Pro membership. That's go.acilearning.com slash twit. Let's talk about Starship. Yay! Because you can't get enough Starship. So we keep (laughs) seeing, you know, if you go to the channels you and I go to on a regular basis, we keep saying, okay, it's stacked. They've got the first stage stacked, the super heavy booster. Oh, they've got Starship up there. Oh, they're moving things around. Oh, looks like they're bringing in liquid oxygen. Very exciting. But there's a snag. We're still waiting for the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, to say, yes, you can launch Please don't hurl any big chunks of concrete in your nearby <laughs> towns or people's cars. Um, so we, you know, we can recap, but but we had a launch attempt last year. Well, it did launch. No, it April succeeded. this year, same year. Oh, same it's this year. year, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cleared the tower, uh, did substantial amount of damage to the launch complex, um, but did clear the tower. Got up to reasonable altitude, and then they had to abort because of a staging issue. But you know, it flew. So now they have a water energy suppression system that they've added at the bottom of the launch pad, which is kind of like a big rocket bidet. And um, it's been tested during a short static fire. Yeah. It appeared to work. So what's the snag? We want to see this thing fly into orbit, man. This is a true back to school story, right? Because the last time we saw Starship fly, it was April. So just after spring break. Uh, at the end of April of 2023, I'm as you recall, I was there. It was amazing. I watched the world's biggest rocket get off the ground and then explode. Yeah, which, rub it in, <laughs> rub it in, <laughs> which Go was ahead. great. It's so loud. I got to tell you. Um, and and so 
now as as kids are going back to school, SpaceX is going to go back to quote unquote school uh, for the the second test flight of this rocket to make sure that it's ready to fly. And a, a lot of things happened over the summer. Number one, SpaceX spent a good long time picking up the pieces of their launch pad. Mm. Uh, they built a water cooled uh, plate, a metal plate. Uh, so if you can imagine, like a, it's basically this 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 surface that they flood with water and then the flames of the first stage hit it and it kind of suppresses the vibrations, which really shook uh, the, the, the rocket uh, during, during liftoff and it protects the pad from the flame, which just carved a ginormous hole beneath the, 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 the gantry on that first flight. And it, it sent concrete out into the ocean, you know, as high as the rocket itself. And it's like, like, like 30 stories tall, this rocket. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and so we've got these, these new photos and these new videos of it. And it looks amazing up there. Like they've, they've got all this work done, but there's still an open investigation or there was an investigation uh, that the FAA was conducting into what they call a mishap. They do that every time there's an accident or right. an abort or something like that. And, um, and it's really, it's really key because as you and I are recording this, the FAA has, you know, confirmed to CNBC and some other uh, some other agencies that they have concluded that mishap study. They have not signed off and said, "Okay, you have a license to fly again, SpaceX," but they said that they've they finished reviewing everything. So they have to make recommendations to SpaceX for mm -hmm. what they need to do. I'm sure that some of those recommendations will be, "Hey, you need a suppression system," and then they can say, "Oh yeah, check, we've already done that," uh, and and then they'll have to vet how well they feel SpaceX has addressed those concerns. And, uh, and then, and only then will they decide whether or not to give them a, a launch license. And there've been a lot of rumors flying around. Oh, SpaceX will probably launch Starship uh, on September 16th, which is like next week or something like that. Right. Yeah. Uh, oh no, it's going to be longer than that. Well, and Elon Musk is, you know, out there on Twitter or X as we're calling it these days. Um, <laughs> you know, saying that they're, they're ready to fly. They're just waiting on the FAA. And that kind of puts a lot of pressure on the FAA, you know, because they don't want to be seen as holding things up erroneously. Right. But at the same time, there are steps to be taken. There was also a report, and I don't know if this is true, so do not quote me on it. But there was a report that, that said that they hadn't done, that SpaceX had not completed um, some, some of like the, the necessary local ordinance stuff about where they're going to put all that water, you know, that wastewater that just gets, you know, the uh, dumped system? out there because this is a nature oh. area, oh, Boca yeah. Chica. So uh, again, I don't know like the veracity of those claims, and uh, mm -hmm. it would be very surprising to me if SpaceX had done something that they really didn't have the permission to do. But you know, in the past, I mean, they've, they've you mean launched like their first launch where they they've launched they they launched a Starhopper, you know, and, and a Starship prototype without having FAA launch, and they asked right. for, for 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 what is it? You, better to ask. They asked for forgiveness, right? Instead of asking for, Instead of for approval. Permission. So we'll, so we'll see how that goes really. But I mean, they there, seem like there's they're likely close. to be a list of corrective actions demanded with this new report, probably. Right. Yeah. There, there'll be a list, but I think that a lot of those might actually have been taken care of already. Like things mm -hmm. like why was there such a long delay between the, the abort decla declaration and the actual flight termination, you know, was that an issue with the flight termination system? What have you done to address that? And then SpaceX will say, well, we've actually, we knew about that already and we've done this, you know? So that's why I think a lot of those corrective actions will likely already have checks waiting for them, uh, for the boxes to be revealed. You know, you need a suppression system. They've built one, uh, now. So, right. and they've already okay. done static fire tests too. So, so, there's been a bunch of stuff coming around out of their fast iteration department. Um, one of them being discussion about, okay, for uh, the uh, super heavy booster, we're not going to catch it with the chopsticks. We're going to add landing legs, which appear to be, I think on the one that's stacked now, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they, 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 they had that originally too on uh. this booster design. It's like this little kind of pop out uh, system there. Right. And, and I think that they had originally had it, on Starship too, where it would land on its fins, like legs and struts that were on the fins themselves right. too. So, you know, I, I, and it would not surprise me that SpaceX is planning a simplification of those designs because the chopsticks, which for people listening, if you have not seen SpaceX's mega Godzilla, mega God, 
Mecca, Mecca, Mechzilla. That's what it's called. Mechzilla, yeah. The Mechzilla. It's launch the, tower. It's the launch tower that has these two arms that are just about the width of the rocket. And they use it like an elevator. They come all the way down and it kind of hooks the starship so it can lift it up the 30 stories or whatever to get pop it right on top of uh, 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 on top of the, the, the super heavy uh, booster itself. And SpaceX has said that when the booster is falling out of the sky, they're going to use the same thing to catch it by catching it on the fence. That sounds super complicated. Uh, it sounds like you risk uh, blowing up your launch pad uh, right. with your first landing attempt. Um, and it's going to be, it's going to be dicey. So it would not surprise me if they try to land uh, with, uh, with legs because they've got a proven track record. They've flown one 15, 16 times uh, right. for Falcon nine. And uh, if they can show precision landing, then with, with the booster, then they can graduate to, you know, a, a catching it on the pad sort of thing. And what do you get by that? You get faster turnaround, which SpaceX needs to reach not just its own flight rate with this booster to make it pay for itself, uh, but to re to make, you know, its testing campaign to get this starship lander to the moon. Because remember, this is what NASA's eggs are in this basket, this starship basket yes. to land astronauts on the moon uh, for the first time in the 21st century. NASA wants to do it in 2025. That's not that far away. And there are things, what, what, what have we not seen for starship? Right, Rod? And please interrupt well, me when you feel, cause I feel like I'm talking a lot. No, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's like going back but, to space race when the lunar module was holding up the party. And I that, feel like that's happening again. They got a lot of stuff to do before they can land two people in that monstrous thing on the lunar yeah, surface. They we have, have to have a, a, a successful launch to orbit, a successful landing from orbit, a yeah. successful refueling in orbit, and a, a successful flight uh, at least around the moon, if not a landing. And I believe that NASA has contracted a test landing with first starship on the moon as well. That's a lot. That's like a lot of major milestones, and they all are like hiding a number of technical uh, innovations that have to be either proven out or tested multiple times in space to make sure that they work. Um, and it's an open question, you know? Well, and let's not forget, we are now adding hot, hot staging to the mix. That's right. That's right. Which is, uh, that's one of the things that SpaceX wants the, to do. Yeah. In the inner stage. Well, I think they're prototyping it now, right? Yeah. Yeah. The inner stage so, has vents. You basically fire the upper stage before, while disconnecting from the lower stage. So you don't have that big delay waiting for the, the stage to drop off. Exactly. So, but oh I, I think that we will see some movement towards a test flight this month. They may not get it by the end of the month, but the, it seems like they're going to be ready by October to fly again. All right. Well, for the drama of SpaceX to black holes, we'll be back after this very <laughs> short break. Stay with us. Okay. If you haven't been pulled into an event horizon, there's a lovely story with, <laughs> I love your, I'm just going to say it, your clickbaity headline, uh, space.com story. But, no, this uh, is, this is actually a life science story. Actually, I'm looking at it now. Um, looks like we picked this up from our friends at life science. Oh, okay. I didn't I'll fix that link in the source. rundown. For later. But, um, but uh, fascinating story about uh, black holes burping out the energy <laughs> from stars they had absorbed, which is a little not quite what's happening i mean if you if you look into a little more um so there have been these observations of black holes that had had ripped a few stars apart which is what black holes do if they're close to a star 24 of them to be specific that's a lot of black but holes the, <laughs> yeah and so you get too close a star gets too close to a black hole and spaghettification which is what they call it begins where it basically starts ripping up the star but the energy from the star the matter from the star gets pulled into the event horizon uh, to uh, the accretion disk. And then it starts getting mysterious. But what's really weird is it's like, it's almost as if these accretion disks are somehow acting like capacitors or batteries and holding this energy. And then at least in the case of these, uh, the observed objects, two to six years later, they start pulsing out these enormous energy signals That's that weird. would appear to be related to the star that the thing destroyed. How the heck does that work, Kip Thorne? <laughs> oh, I don't know. You're asking me. I mean, I'm as I, a flummoxed as the scientists, you know. Oh, uh, they said they were too, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're saying, you know, they're, they're looking back and they're seeing a very large fraction of these black holes that don't have this emission. And then all of a sudden they, quote unquote, 
Turn On, and that was the study's lead author, Yvette Sendes, and she's a research associate at Harvard, uh, the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And so she told our friends at Life Science all about that, and she's the one that called it a burp because, as she says, they're having this delay where the material is not coming out of the disk until way later than they were expecting. I just think it's another example of black holes are weird. They're going to kill us all, <laughs> just like Disney predicted in the that classic uh, movie, The Black Hole. Starring Anthony Perkins. Oh, oh, don't even. So <laughs> I saw the black hole with, with great anticipation, and it truly was a black hole in so many ways. That was one of the worst <laughs> movies I'd ever seen. My favorite part oh, was, the you're so big, mean. was the tunnel at the end where they're finally entering the black hole, which is why you would see the movie in the first place, right? They go down this big tunnel that looks like it's made out of spray-painted tinfoil, and at the very end, if you recall, it looks like there's either moths or angels or something flying at the end of this tunnel. And it's like, what in God's name were you guys thinking? So that was in 79, right? That yes. movie was made. So then in 1980, I was in, uh, I think, Japan or Thailand at that point. I think I was spending about a month in Japan. And I really wanted to see something Western. You know, I was just. I was I was pretty strung out because I was traveling solo for about half a year. So I went to a movie theater to see Black Hole one more time because I thought it can't be as bad as I remembered. So I went up in this little glass enclosed area in the balcony where they at least had English translation, although you could also step aside and hear Japan. So I kept hearing these uh, unfamiliar voices saying, Spako-san. <laughs> it was really kind of weird. And it was every bit as hideous as the first time. Sorry, no, just had to. No, I think you know. I think it means well. What I think that this news of these burping black holes uh, that that because you're the one that picked this story uh, as as one of the things to discuss. Well, I wanted uh, some astronomy. Well, no, and I I totally I am there for it. I'm just saying that black holes are objects of fascination dating way way back, especially in pop culture. And by the way, Disney's been trying to remake the black hole for quite Please some don't. time. So we got we got to do a short list of like the black holes we want to see in there. Do we want Cygnus X one uh, or uh, or uh, uh, I just want the attempt to remake that hideous movie swallowed into a black hole, so we don't have to sit through it again. So well, keep so, your eye keep your eye on 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 Doctor um, uh, Doctor Sendez here because they are still watching uh, these black holes hmm. for these these burping events because they. They, they're the shredding of their companion stars, these tidally disruptive events. Um, they, they still see some of them are getting brighter. These black holes, mm. uh, you know, they're not done with the flare ups and hopefully we'll, we'll figure out exactly why this is happening because is it a different kind of black hole? Is it a, you know, is it a white hole? I, we've never seen one of those. I saw one in a Star Trek comic book one time because <laughs> it's Star Trek day. Uh, but, but <laughs> well, and, you know, they made the point that, towards the end of the article that the energy isn't being returned out of the black hole because it can't right? yeah at least yeah. by their estimation so uh, the best they could come up with is either something to do with the accretion disk or something nearby and another black question hole. Mark. yeah so yeah, it's, a, it's a wide open story and and i want to make sure we get time for some of the ones you have uh favored mark favored here because we're not gonna have time for all of them but i just want to I want to queue up one more because I, I want to snicker at Russia a little bit, yeah. <laughs> which is very small minded of me. But, you know, that's my role in the show. So I figure I should. I, I, should I saw it. I saw it on the list and I, I even have my little note saying, should we really? But OK, go ahead. <laughs> well, so again, as I've said before, you know, I grew up during the space race and it was a competition with the Soviet Union. So, you know, you, you grow up with that kind of sensibility and it's it doesn't completely go away. But then. You know, so I get over it. You know, I'm a recovering nationalist. I get over it. And then Rogozin takes over <laughs> Roscosmos and practically begs Dimi us to go Dim back in. Dimitri huh? Rogozin. Dimitri Rogozin. Right, Dimitri people, Rogozin, yeah. who was a total clown. And so he starts throwing down the gauntlet and telling us to fly brooms because our rockets don't work and all this stuff up to use our trampolines. Space station. He said to use trampolines. Trampolines and brooms. And, and in, in the meantime, we're paying at that point, I think, $86 million per seat. Yeah. to fly to the space station that we paid for the most of upwards of 90 okay. now huh it's upwards of 90 million now per se. yeah well good luck good luck making those sales so at the same time their space programs kind of you know folding up its head a bit and to be more specific we just had the loss of luna 25 
Now, the Soviet Union back in the bad old days in the 50s and 60s had a record of great achievement in terms of getting their their goals realized in the form of a spacecraft that left Earth, usually in pairs, but not a great record of success on the other end because their computing technology wasn't quite up to snuff with the Wests and so forth. So they just kept hurling spacecraft to the moon and Mars and kind of winning the contest, their side of the contest by mass if they won at all. That said, still haven't had a successful landing on Mars 60 plus years later. But they achieved some really great things, especially at Venus. I mean, their program success at Venus was was laudable, and and I give them that. But in modern days, they've had the abort of the Soyuz rocket that was headed to the space station, which is yep. bad. Roscosmos had a major reorganization in 2016 with the stated intention to improve reliability and cut the workforce. And which that, the numbers that, I read. Huh? And that, that, that took it semi-private, if memory serves. Right. Me. Yeah, yeah, so. a state corporation. And the numbers I read were at that time they had between 240 and 250,000 direct employees compared to NASA's 70,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, big concerns were theft and corruption is major problems. Then fade to 2021, they signed an agreement with China for the International Lunar Research Station, which I kind of wonder if China's sort of scratching their heads over that one now. But... Um, in then 2021, and then, of course, with the invasion of Ukraine, they start losing international contracts, and their you, launch rate has gone way down. I mean, you, they you were one of the major the, launch providers for years. You forgot the leaky Soyuz that had the hole in it in space. Well, that was our right? fault, because <laughs> our astronaut went in there and drilled that hole. So oh, my gosh. Go home, right? yeah. yeah, so a lot of reliability problems. Clearly, they have problems in terms of uh, assembly fabrication and testing on the ground, and their budget's not as big as it used to be and so on and so forth according to this article i read anyway roscosmos directly launched nine rockets in 2022 and so far only seven this year which is mm -hmm. a a pale comparison to their past so and then on the other end of course we have them saying yeah we've got the angara new crewed spacecraft it'll be here any minute you know when when yeah <laughs> so what's going that, on that, so, that's actually an open question insights. so so Number one, China has doubled down on cooperation with, with Russia, especially after the, the Luna 25. There were interviews with Chinese space officials, as well as I believe the president there, uh, you know, saying, is this, you know, giving you pause on your, your faith in this country as a, as a partner? They said, no, they're, they're all in uh, for it now. And so I think that, that that partnership is going to continue. Now, a lot of that might have been frayed by the ongoing war in the Ukraine. And I have heard uh, or been just reading like right through the news um, that China is a little nonplussed with how that that whole uh, situation has evolved in terms of being you know related as a, a close partner. Uh, so that's a, a political hurdle that, that has to be uh, addressed. But you are right. There have been a lot of challenges for the Russian space industry over the time, you know, things like quality control. Uh, there was a year where they had uh, uh, multiple progress failures uh, and, and launch failures. Um, uh, progress but, is their but, cargo pro deliverer. That's right, progress cargo deliveries. Um, but I should point out that it wasn't just for Russia because Northrop Grumman lost a, uh, an Antares uh, Cygnus uh, uh, cargo flight and, uh, and then uh, SpaceX lost a Dragon flight uh, that that failed right after liftoff in the same six month period. So it's not like it was a one off. And oh my God, Russia's awful. Uh, okay, it but was, but let's be fair. Neither SpaceX nor Northrop Grumman thumbed their noses at Russia and said, "Nanner, nanner, nanner." You're right. I just you're I point have out to that use trampolines to get to your space station. I just I point out. I just pointed it out because because yeah. that 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 was a really weird time when it came to space access to the space station for cargo, and we saw failures on. Um, uh, yeah. across both commercial as well as the, the national complexes there. Um, but uh, but the, the, those failures were coupled on the Russian side with um, at least one proton failure, a proton rocket, a spectacular launch uh, that was captured on video and just, just a horrifying fireball uh, that led to a loss of a, I believe it was a research satellite. And, uh, and then you have both the, the, just the long turnaround that it takes to create the, the Soyuz and the progress vehicles and the fact that they've been having a lot of just, just challenges. We talked about the leaky one uh, that, that was uh, on the station. Um, they, we recently just, you know, had a, a cosmonaut and an astronaut spend a year in space. They are coming back, right? 
uh, but they spent a, a, a year in space because they had to leave uh, their, um, uh, their Soyuz and let it, you know, return to earth and get a replacement right. sent up. Uh, and that's happening, you know, this calendar year, those guys have spent an extra six months in space because of issues over uh, the quality of the spacecraft. And, and those are, are, are questions you don't want to see rising in, in a space program as mature and as storied as Roscosmos is. They were the first to put a person in space, the first space station, the first spacewalk, all of those things early in the space race. And so it is a little bit disappointing to see how, how kind of, uh, how the, the luster of those achievements have worn, you know, to the point that we see them now uh, today. Um, and it is an open question what, what the levels of investment are going to be in, in the future. There, there's talk again about using the Russian segment of the space station as a standalone, which I thought that those talks had, you know, had, uh, uh, had run their course. Now you're and talking about when we decommission the space station, they want to take their modules. They back want to take their modules years, back and create their own which thing. Which at that point will be close to 30 years old. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the U S segment needs those modules, you know, for, for propulsion to come down. That's why NASA has actually come up with a second option on how they could deorbit the station themselves with their own vehicles, because they're not certain, you know, uh, if if Russia's going to stick to it or not, so 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 those th- there are open questions for those things definitely. I th- will they where will there be a Russian space program in the next five ten years? Yes, is it going to be any more than it is now, which is just a transportation system to low Earth orbit? I can't say, and I, I need to see this next generation vehicle actually built, which we've been right. seeing some art renderings about it. We haven't seen an Angara fly in quite some time and the one that's supposed to fly the crew module is an improved version of that and so um you know we've got some we've got some some hurdles facing that program and whether or not the finances are there to support it well for the last two stories uh i'm going to turn them over to you but i suspect that you're just aching aching to talk about the, the let me see if i get this right it's the last super moon of summer <laughs> yeah oh i got boy. i got three sky watching things you know we were talking about going back to school and things to put on your calendar right for the school year and and i've got three things that i would like listeners to know about uh, just so that they're aware number one is on hey, september 20- 20 listeners <laughs> exciting news you know, n- number one is there is there is another full moon this month. Surprise, surprise. There's one every month. Uh, actually, last month there were two, right? <laughs> but this is special because it's the last super moon of the year. It's also the last super moon of four consecutive super moons this summer, uh, back to back to back to back. Uh, and so, uh, you know, NASA um, and Earth, Earth Sky actually has um, uh, a nice kind of overview um, from earlier in the summer where they kind of laid out why this was happening. The next supermoon, I believe, is going to be in August of 2024. Um, but, you know, if you missed any of the last three big bright full moons, uh, don't miss this one. It's also the harvest moon because, uh, you know, of when it falls in line with the summer harvest, you know, the farmers would go out and use the extra light of the full moon to squeeze in some extra harvest hours. That's the... Um, the uh, uh, entomology of that, uh, that, that moniker itself. Uh, and at the same time, as we're waiting for the full moon, there's this new comet in the sky, Comet Nishimura, which is actually thrilling uh, sky watchers around the world. Right now, it is too dim to see with the unaided eye. But if you've got a good, uh, uh, powerful telescope, um, my colleague Brett Tingley uh, has a, a story from this week on space.com all about what those, what the comet itself looks like. And, uh, and it's starting to, to heat up. So uh, astronomers, uh, amateur astronomers are, are tracking it over time. You might be able to see it uh, in the night sky. Uh, so I would advise people to, uh, to check out that. I believe it's crossing the um, Southern sky. It was discovered by the Panstar system in Hawaii, but um it's it's been making a closest approach on September seventeenth in about a week and a half. Um, that's my birthday. Yeah, it's yeah. just for me. So that that's so its closest are they, to the sun. Are they expecting this to become a binocular object or it, a naked eye object, possibly? It may now. But binoculars and telescopes can help. 
Um, now, you would need small to medium size telescopes uh, mm. to be able to see the greenish aspect of it. Um, so you would need something fairly, fairly hardy, like some sports glasses, not not a little teeny tiny uh, set of binoculars. Uh, but you would be able to resolve the comet's tail, such as it is, and the greenish orb of the coma uh, and whatnot, if you have um, uh, uh, a higher power uh, set of, of observation uh, tools. It's interesting. There, there was some solar eruptions over the last week from the sun, and they actually blew away the tail from the the comet uh, as as these amateurs watched, and then they were able to watch the tail reform again, uh, or in the uh, in cool. the days that follow, which is just absolutely amazing. And they've got like video of seeing it happen, which is just crazy. Wow. So, uh, and and it's it's you know we were talking about the asteroid earlier, and I mentioned these things because while yes they happen every now and then when we know that they're in advance, I want to share it with people because the sure. night sky is the easiest thing that we get to observe. Uh, the moon, you make fun of me, but the moon is the easiest thing that people can, can I check never. out. And <laughs> I would never, especially if you watch it over time. But so, I did go out, I was down in Long Beach at the boat and I went outside on the night of the super fantastic, amazing, unbelievable <laughs> the blood snake worm moon and looked up and I thought of you as I wow. thought, yeah, it looks like the full moon I see every, every couple of, you know, every month of my very long life. But, but I now digress. We, we I, have a we have a sky map on space dot com for uh, Comet Nishimura from our uh, our friends at the Sky Live, uh, and and if you're looking for it tonight, look in the eastern sky in the constellation Leo because that's where it is. Now you do want to have a telescope or 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 some binoculars. You're not going to see it with your unaided eye at least for now, but Rod, on your birthday, yes. when it swings closest to the sun, yes. you know, there's always the chance that there might be something inside the comet that, you know, sublimates because of that heat from the sun uh, and makes it flare up. And that's when we might get the chance to see something to the unaided eye. We'll have to wait and see. And when these comets go around the sun, it's never uh, a given that they're going to survive. Sometimes they crumble. Sometimes they dissolve. Right. Sometimes they get burned up by the sun uh, overall if they get too close. So, uh, so we'll have to wait and see. But it, I just wanted to put that on everyone's radar because if if you can't see the comet, uh, there is one more thing, and this happens in October. So mark your calendars for October fourteenth because uh, NASA uh, has a whole big solar eclipse shenanigans. And that's line 51, Ant, if, uh, if, uh, if, 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 if you need it, um, because there is going to be a solar eclipse across the United States from, I want to say, Oregon through Texas. Partial. Uh, partial. No, not even partial. It's an annular solar eclipse. Yeah, but then eclipse. annular is a partial. So, it, I mean, if you've ever seen an annular. Ooh, I got it, some thunder. It looks wow. like the sun <laughs> gets a little darker, depending on how annular it is. and But you have to have, just be very clear with people. If you're going to look at it, you have to have a sun viewer because glasses, the perimeter solar of the sun, it, yeah, legitimate ones. Because there was a bunch that came out from the last eclipse. I did a story for you on that because I wrecked my eyes as a young man by looking at the sun improperly with my telescope. It's not as stupid as it sounds. I had a filter, but nobody told me you weren't supposed to use it for hours at a time. I had cataracts by the time I was 52 which is unusual. They made a big deal about it at the surgeon. Like, hey, everybody, come look at this guy's eyes. They really screwed up. Um, so make sure you get good viewers that are, you know, from a reputable dealer. Uh, Amazon was flooded with with counterfeits last time. But you see the perimeter of the sun around the moon, right? Yeah. I see. In fact, if if Ant, if you could show that NASA page. Um, He's got uh, it and if, Yeah. And if, and, and if if we go down a bit, uh, I believe... I believe it's going to show us a little bit of what we're going to be able to see. Um, uh, these are these are different maps uh, for the the actual event itself, and an annular solar eclipse. It's called a ring of fire eclipse. And the reason that you're seeing two tracks is because NASA is very very excited. And on April eighth of twenty twenty four, there's going to be a total solar eclipse that's also going to cross the United States. Right. So that's the one going from lower left to upper right. The exactly. Upper left to lower right. And let me just mention that it will enter looks like near the Oregon Washington border if i read that chart correctly it was a little hard well it's going to um, it's going to enter through Oregon uh uh purely uh, on the way down okay um, on october 14th so it goes through Oregon 
Nevada, Utah, Nevada. New Mexico, and then exits through Texas. Exactly, exactly. And that Texas that's the, gets two eclipses. That's right. In a year's time. Lucky that's right. Uh, San Antonio, Texas, by the way, if you, if people are thinking about traveling to the eclipse, is one of the, the cities that is in the actual crosshairs of these two eclipses. So if you want to oh, see wow. a twofer over the, uh, the next six months, uh, you know, this is probably something that, that you might want to do. And let's, That's let's, a long time let's to stay, stay in San Antonio. <laughs> let's stay, let's stay on, on, on this, on this big map right here. And so this is the map that we were talking about. And I, I bring it up now because we are a month, just over a month out from the October 14th solar eclipse. And this is a good time if, if people want to, to plan. I and mean, this is a NASA, um, a solar system.nasa.gov map where you can go and find out where it's going to be. And, and what you see coming from the left, uh, down, diagonal down, that's the October 14th solar eclipse path. And the moon, again, will not block the sun so that it's going to make everything dark, like in a total solar eclipse. But as you see there, uh, the, that's the path that the annular ring of fire effect will take. And that just is really eerie, where the moon is just a smidgen too far from the Earth that when it crosses in front of the moon, it doesn't or it crosses in front of the sun, it doesn't cover it all the way. Whereas that second line going from the lower left up through Maine, you can see it comes up across Mexico, uh, across Texas, Oklahoma, uh, Arkansas, bits of Missouri, Illinois. By the way, it crosses Carbondale, Illinois, where I was for the 2017 eclipse. They get to see two eclipses too. Um, and Ohio, Pennsylvania, bits of New York, a lot of states, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Canada. Um, that's the total solar eclipse. And that's where uh, it's going to be total, total, uh, totally covered. It will get dark. It'll get cooler, which is really, really eerie. Some of the animals go to sleep because they think it's nighttime. Right. Uh, that's where you see all that. And you can take your glasses off and look at the sun uh, at that for that brief moment of totality uh, there too, to just see the, the, the crazy weirdness uh, of it all. And so I, I just want people to be thinking about what do they want to see? Uh, for these two events. You could watch it live on space.com, on NASA, if you want, if you don't want to travel, or if you can't. Um, and I think that if you can't go to one of these events in person, please watch it or at least follow it online because they are just amazing coincidences of astronomical happenstance that the moon and the sun and the earth line up to give us these kinds of shows every now and then. And I would like the people to know about it. The more people, the better. <laughs> Gentlemen, um, Yes, I, I noticed on this this third or fourth map down there. It looks yep. like there's South America uh, showing up in here. And is it common to, for for people to be able to see eclipse or, or any type of coverage like this that far oh, yeah, down show, in the lower hemisphere like that? Show, show show the map. Show the map. Yeah. So this is this is actually a really good example of you know we keep localizing these events and uh, where we say oh yeah it's from these it's going to cross these states it's the quote unquote great American solar eclipse which was the 2017 one but these eclipses actually the shadow crosses um, a set path across the the surface of the Earth based on where the moon is and where the earth is in its orbit. And so it does create this long arc. So it does keep going. So we've been talking a lot about where people would go in the United States because most of our readers and listeners are from, uh, uh, you know, that area. Uh, but the October 14th event will be visible from parts of Central America, parts of South America. Uh, it looks like Brazil gets the lion's share uh, of it. Uh, but a lot of the countries in, in, in uh, uh, Central America do get a little bit of it uh, too. And uh, and so that does happen. But most of the time, Ant, uh, it, you know, especially for a total solar eclipse, you will get a lot of this track. You can see it even in that map that we saw earlier is over the ocean. And when that happens, it's very hard for anyone to see it, especially if it's in a really remote place, because it can happen anywhere on, on the globe. And uh, some of them are in Antarctica, and then just the penguins get to see it. You know, uh, if it's in uh, uh, the Arctic, it might be just some place where the, the all you have are polar bears, you know, and maybe polar bear dogs with our friend uh, Pascal Lee, you know, in, 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 in the Arctic. Um, so, um, it is good to know that there is a long track. And so when we talk about, oh, you should think about where you're going to be, um, people in South America should pay attention to if they want to go see one. Uh, there was a really nice one in Chile uh, a few years back in 2019 that really got a lot of attention and uh, maybe a little bit more so because of the 2017 one that went across the country at that time. 
Well, I just want to add, so I saw the 2017 one as well in beautiful Prineville, Oregon, where apparently nobody else was interested in seeing Eclipse because <laughs> the park was practically empty. But it's kind of a life-altering experience. I mean, it is amazing. This, the sky, at totality, if it's clear, the sky gets almost kind of pearlescent. And as you pointed out, temperature drops. You can actually see the shadow moving towards you sometimes. We saw I Venus mean, come out. I thought it was. I thought I was going to be ready for it, Rod. I had never seen a total solar eclipse. I hadn't either. And, and, and I want to see another one. Yeah, and so so we've got our chance. April eighth. Everyone plan for it. You know, <laughs> I, I, I where remember are you going to be? Seeing the 2017 in my backyard um, in North Carolina, and it and it was such a weird experience. And and hearing the crickets and cicadas come out because, I, like you said, everybody thought it was night, and it's mm -hmm. just yeah, it was so weird. And uh, I'll never forget that it was a hot, hot day. But then all of a sudden, yeah, yeah. this stuff happens, and, and it was just like, wow, what is happening to this planet? Now, uh, yeah. one more question, though. I asked that about South America because, again, I think I've spoken to you guys in the past about just going out and shooting moon photography here versus when I used mm -hmm. to shoot it in, in the Carolinas. It just seems like it's a whole different experience because of the, the point of view, I guess. Um, when we have other eclipse um, throughout time or what have you, you said it sometimes it'll be more in the poles versus sometimes yeah. more in the ocean. Um, are there times where it actually just sort of totally miss the continental U S yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and in fact, in fact, uh, uh, there is a, um, an eclipse maps website and NASA has an eclipse.nasa.gov website. I'll try to make sure I get those links in the, in the rundown, um, where you can actually see the paths of almost every major, uh, eclipse, solar eclipse for okay. the next like hundred plus years. And that, that, you know, the nice thing is that we know, that that's what's going to happen because it's all celestial mechanics. The reason that it is, is in a different place is because that's where the shadow of the moon will fall on the earth in that alignment between the sun, the earth and where or the, the moon and where the earth is in its orbit around the sun uh, between where the, the, the earth's tilt is in res, you know, respect to the moon's shadow uh, and what, and whatnot, you know, when the, when the, uh, when the moon uh, is, you know, the, the shadow doesn't line perfectly or it doesn't actually reach our, uh, the, the earth. That's when we get a lot of partial uh, eclipses and stuff like that too. You don't see it touch to get that totality over time. And when that, when that happens, I'll be thinking of Ant as he's staring up a total eclipse and he's somehow thinking of sports. Ah. Something, some sports related thing to do yes. with a total eclipse. A deep touchdown pass for about 60 yards. Yes, that's, that's there we go. Okay, perfect yeah. analogy. Everyone, I would like to thank you for joining us today for the Tarek Malik Variety Hour. <laughs> it was a good time. Thank you for taking that on, Tarek. Uh, I'd also like to remind people that today is the last day to sign the New Horizons petition to keep that mission going. If you wish to do that, you can go to go.nss.org slash new dash horizons. That's go.nss.org slash new dash horizons. We are currently at 6,675 signatures with 357 of those having come in the day. So this will be bundled up and sent off to NASA headquarters by the National Space Society and a couple of other groups on Monday. So this is your, your last chance to weigh in if you're interested in helping save that mission and uh, making our friend Dr. Stern happy. Tarek? Where are you attending your back to school class these days? Yes, well, people can find me on space.com uh, all the time. We had a, a pretty busy weekend last weekend with lots of crew six landings and launches. We've got another launch uh, tonight and tomorrow. Uh, so I'll be watching those ones. Uh, when I'm not doing that, uh, you can find me tweeting about it on on Twitter or X, right? At Tarek J. Malik. And if you do like Fortnite games and and Star, Star Trek games. You can find me at at Spacetron Plays, uh, if you will. New new videos every week, usually. A lot of them with, with dad puns in them. So I apologize Ooh. in advance if people don't like those kind of puns. So, All right. Well, of course, you can always find me at pilebooks.com and at adastromagazine.com. And since this is the back-to-school special, I'd probably still be in school if I could afford it because I enjoyed it a lot. But the last time I checked, my alma mater was 56000 per year. So maybe I won't go. Although, Tarek, I checked, I did some comparative shopping 
And I see that USC is $61,500 per year now. Oh, so maybe Stanford isn't such a bad deal after all. <laughs> maybe not. So. And, and it, 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 it's 9,000 acres of glorious nature as opposed to uh, downtown Los Angeles. But I digress. I got Please, four years before I got to worry about that stuff. So <laughs> Yeah, that'll go fast. Don't forget to drop us a line at twists at twit.tv. That's T-W-I-S at twit.tv. We always, always welcome your comments, suggestions, and jokes. Especially jokes. You guys have been falling down the job. Um, <laughs> don't forget to check out space.com, websites in the name, and the National Space Society, of course, at nss.org. New, <coughs> excuse me, new episodes of this podcast publish every single Friday on your favorite podcatcher. So make sure to subscribe, tell your friends, give us reviews, thumbs up, five stars, and six poodles, whatever it is they're, they're asking for. And you can head to our website at twit.tv slash twists. Finally, don't forget, you can get all the great programming on the Twit Network ad-free at Club Twit, as well as some extras you'll only find there. For just $7 a month, what a bargain that is. You can also follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter and on Facebook and Twit.tv on Instagram. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here. In case you hadn't heard, Home Theater Geeks is back. Each week, I bring you the latest audio video news, tips and tricks to get the most out of your AV system, product reviews, and more. You can enjoy Home Theater Geeks only if you're a member of Club Twit, which costs 7 bucks a month. Or you can subscribe to Home Theater Geeks by itself for only $2.99 a month. I hope you'll join me for a weekly dose of Home Theater Geekitude.